Hey guys, welcome back. This week's video is about hidden details in the game that have some serious lore implications. While I do use a camera mod to investigate these, this is more than the typical look at this object out of bounds video you might find. With that in mind, I've selected 7 things that I found interesting and worth talking about. Kick back and relax while I walk you through them. Let's talk about 7 Hidden Mysteries. Number 1. The Gerudo Peninsula Let's start off with one that is in plain sight, but something we can't really investigate normally. The fact that the Gerudo Desert extends all the way out into the sea. We could see this in Breath of the Wild. But given the sheer amount of vertical distance we have in Tears of the Kingdom, it's much easier to see in the new game. Still, there are many questions about it, such as if it is flat like a beach, or has a massive cliff going into the sea, and how this section over by Mount Gak interacts with the huge ravine around the east and north of Hyrule. We can see that the coast rises up pretty high into a cliff, and so there isn't exactly a beach here. I suppose it is possible that the Gerudo could have climbed down and built docks or other structures to become a seafaring culture, but there isn't any real sign of wood out there. I realize that such objects as trees may not load given we were never meant to get this close to these areas, but I propose a different situation, which is that given the extreme temperatures of the desert, it only gets progressively more hot. At the very edge of the map, I found that during midday, it reaches 130 degrees Fahrenheit, or 54 degrees Celsius for you metric folks. That's as hot as the Mojave Desert, better known as Death Valley here in the United States. But the Lut Desert over in Iran gets as high as 160 degrees Fahrenheit, or 70 degrees Celsius. Coming back to this fictional desert, it's possible the Gerudo Desert only gets hotter the further out you go. And so, even the desert fauna could not grow out there. Perhaps there are reasons for this we don't currently have answers to. That is a topic for another day. Over here on the east side, we can see that the desert reaches the canyon on the border of Hyrule. Originally, I thought you couldn't see this from the game normally. But to my surprise, you can see this detail from the King Gliok Island in the sky. I find it interesting that this detail is given at all. As such, I took the camera over there while preserving as much high poly model of the terrain I could. This footage speaks for itself. You can see how the desert sand flows into the canyon. While the next Zelda game is moving away from this era of Hyrule, it's possible that they will continue to use this map as a base to keep their world consistent. Maybe the next game will be a thousand years in the future from this. Who knows? Moving along. Number 2 the Sheikah Virtue Shrines The connections between Breath and Tears is very interesting because the direct continuity of the two titles gives the Zelda team the freedom to play and explore with many interesting concepts. Some of these they do well, while others are done very, very poorly. The complete disappearance of the Sheikah technology is the prime example of this, and how nobody in the game talks about this, no matter how much of an expert they were with it in the previous game. Specifically for this entry, I'm looking at three shrines from Breath of the Wild, the ones that were at the Springs of Virtue. We have the Tusuwa Nima Shrine at the Spring of Power, the Jitan Same Shrine at the Spring of Wisdom, and the Sha -e Katha Shrine at the Spring of Courage. In that game, you would access each of these shrines by offering a scale from one of the respected dragons to the spring as an offering to Hylia. The process would activate a Sheikah device built into the wall, granting access to a room with a shrine in it. In Tears of the Kingdom though, the doors to these rooms are simply not there, instead replaced with rock walls. So are these rooms still there out of bounds? Clipping through the wall reveals that they have been completely removed, but there is an empty space where they once were. We can even move Link into them and explore some, but it's mostly just water and broken wall textures, which makes sense given that we were never meant to interact with them. To me, it seems as though these locations are simply meant to be solid rock now, which is odd considering there was a cavity here with a shrine that persisted for over 10,000 years. If we consider though that the Sheikah technology all completely vanished, then whatever technology was in place to create the shrine, the door, and the room itself may have all been connected to the same process. 
When that process ended for whatever unexplained reason, all things being made by that process reverted. This includes an area of solid stone that was being altered into a room for a shrine. This is an interesting idea I'll have to play with another time, as it could be a good basis to excuse away some of the lazy placement and removal of Breath of the Wild's most defining world trait, the sheer amount of Sheikah technology that was littering its map. Number 3. Mipha's Ocean Shrine On the topic of Sheikah Shrines, I want to take a look at the specific one from the Champion of the Ballads DLC, the Kidafuna Shrine out in the ocean. As a part of the quest, you had to swim out to it in a trial that Mipha undertook when she was becoming a champion. This shrine is interesting because it rests on a tall pillar that rises just under the waves. If the Sheikah Shrines mysteriously vanished from all over the map, you would think that this pillar would remain, right? Coming out to this location in Tears of the Kingdom, there is no sign of it remaining, which is odd. The only thing that marks this spot is this Octorok. Honestly, I think this would have been a really good spot to put a Korok. Removing the shrine is understandable, but to remove the pillar implies that the pillar itself was somehow related to the Sheikah technology. Taking the camera into the water in Tears of the Kingdom, we can see how there isn't anything in the ocean depths either. I suppose it is possible that the pillar broke underwater, but even if I use my big Zonai measuring stick I had back in my water measuring video, we can clearly see that there is nothing to interact with under the water. As such, I can rule out that any part of a pillar might still be there. It would seem, in addition to the shrine that rested on it, the whole thing has vanished. And sadly, I doubt this will ever be explained. Number 4. The Astral Observatory Alright, this one is more interesting. Fans of my channel know I have a little bit of an obsession with the Astral Observatory. When given the option to clip through walls, it was at the top of my list to investigate, as I simply wanted to know if the room still existed in the game. What I found is fascinating. Clipping down through the sealed entry in the throne room, we find that the cylinder leading to it is now missing. Going down into the out of bounds area, we find something very interesting indeed, a dome under the throne room. The dome's shape is a bit off though, for as we know, the astral observatory was a perfect half sphere. Here is a picture of the wall outline on the map. When observing this dome, it is squished, for lack of a better word. Almost as though they took the room and made it this strange ellipse shape. We can go inside of this dome and move Link to it, revealing that there is geometry we can interact with. While the outside walls are a generic stone texture we see, the inside wall textures are completely messy. This is possibly because the textures for the Sheikah stuff were deleted from the game, as they were no longer needed in Tears of the Kingdom. Well, except for a few textures that were recycled assets used for the poor towers. As such, they may not have even bothered to apply a new texture to these walls since the player is never meant to go here. As for why the outside of the wall is textured, I believe that is because it is the same texture we see over in the library wall that once revealed part of the observatory. It would seem that the Sheikah texture was simply swapped out and replaced with a generic stone texture, a lazy way of making things disappear. It's really telling because in the library, the wall where the Sheikah texture once was is still marked as unclimbable despite it being normal stone now. As for why the observatory shape has been altered, I have some speculation about that. In my previous videos about the Astral Observatory, I showed a spot on the Hyrule Pillar where Link can ascend through it into the throne room. Such an action implies that Link traveled through the Astral Observatory. What is interesting is when I looked at the spot I found and compared it to the outline of the dome. It is just barely outside of the area. I think they changed the dimensions of this room to prevent the player from being able to ascend into it. In doing so, it creates the implication that the observatory is now completely filled, perhaps even by soil from a recently dug lake nearby. Likewise, in the imprisoning chamber where the tip of the pillar is, there should be an ascension point going straight up into the astral observatory. That spot is simply not allowed for unexplained reasons. But, it seems likely that outside of the escape columns from the depths, any ascension that would pass through the ground barrier is simply not allowed. I personally wish they had allowed this one point to let you travel into the observatory. And, who knows, maybe find some cool leftover Sheikah weapons or something. I mean, the Calamity Ganon was made of them after all. Wasted potential aside, 
The end result is that the remains of the observatory are here, and its shape has been altered. The whole discovery does beg the question, why resize the dome instead of simply deleting it outright? If I had to guess, I would say that there may have been some cut content about using the room in the main game. Perhaps they abandoned the concept, or left it with the intent of coming back to it in DLC. Perhaps its reduced size was to show that half the room had collapsed. Can you imagine how cool it would be to have shown the observatory busted open with half of it on the surface, and half of it in the air? Sadly, I can only guess why they abandoned this. As for the fate of the room itself canonically, it would seem that the room has been filled with rubble, dirt, and if you believe my past video, a whole bunch of guardian husk. You should check that video out if you haven't already. It's a good one. Number 5. The High Roll Pillar Tip Related to the Astral Observatory is the huge pillar that the Sheikah burrowed into while constructing it. This pillar extends all the way down into the depths, into the imprisoning chamber itself. It's well documented now that the tip is called a purification unit in the game's files, and that when viewed out of bounds from the start of the game, has interesting engravings on it as well as some technology that seems Sheikah in origin. It would seem that the old theory about tapping into the energy source to power their machines may be true, and that the Astral Observatory could be the central hub that routed it to the rest of the network. That interesting theory aside, what I want to know is where the tip is in the present after Ganondorf shoved the whole spike up. Previously, I had calculated its position in the floor and marked it on the map I made. If we clip through the floor, we can actually find the tip. Here, I've lit up the area around the tip with light blooms to help with visibility. I'm a little surprised that the tip exists here at all since you cannot access this area. Sadly, the purification unit that was on the tip is now missing. It makes sense they didn't bother to put it on. It may have only had the tip here as the pillar itself may have been completely modeled and then adjusted up and down when creating the chasm. At least, that is how I would have done it. To me, it seems the purification unit ought to still be on it, and is not detailed here as we were never meant to see the tip throughout our journey. What is more questionable though is how the pillar moved upward without collapsing the ceiling of the imprisoning chamber, and how this section of ground is supporting this over a kilometer high spike of stone with the majority of the castle on it. We know little about this stone, and I'm afraid I'll have to put that on the shelf for another day. Number 6. Rito Village Depths Speaking of mysterious huge pillars, it is worth talking about the one in Rito Village. The entire village is built around it in an elaborate spiral settlement. In Breath of the Wild, we can see the Divine Beast perch on it when taking aim at the castle. Back in that game, given the sheer size, I had assumed that the perch was created by the Sheikah when they made the Divine Beast. Given the stone remains after the disappearance of the Sheikah technology, that clearly isn't the case. We can actually see this stone predates the Calamity entirely. In the cutscene, the Gerudo Assault, for a brief moment we can see it when the camera is moving around. As such, we can tell that Rito Village, or at least the site that would become it, existed as far back as the founding of the kingdom. While this is interesting on its own, I mainly want to talk about what we see in the depths when exploring this location. People previously have clipped through the ground and found that under the mining facility below Rito Village, there is a huge inaccessible hole. When I first heard about this, I thought that it was the mirror to the central stone in the village a cavity that reflected the surface like we see throughout much of the depths. It turns out though, that assumption was wrong. Looking at the hole in question now, it seems obvious to me that this is not meant to be the mirror of the central rock, but instead something related to the mining facility. Here I have outlined it on the map and you can see how the circle it forms doesn't overlap with the central stone at all. It also doesn't go anywhere deep enough to mirror the stone up top. Another interesting aspect is that the inside of this hole is fully textured. You can even ascend through these giant plant roots. Of course, we are never meant to access this location, and so I can't help but to wonder what they were originally planning for this. It's worth noting that the square section on the side here doesn't have anything of interest in it, and the walls are completely covered in gloom. As much as I wish that there was an inverted stone down here, I am left concluding that there simply isn't. 
and that this whole is nothing more but a remnant of an incomplete idea. Number 7. Clean Hyrule Castle At the end of the game, we get a very brief view of Hyrule Castle. This scene is interesting because it is the only time we see it not afflicted with gloom while raised into the sky. I took this opportunity to investigate it because I wanted to see some of the finer details of the castle. What I ended up finding is that the castle itself is the same one that we see throughout the game, but all the gloom has been removed. It's also using a lower polygon model, so not all the detail is intact for it. A pity. Perhaps it isn't surprising that they removed the gloom, but why I've included this on the list is because of the implications of it regarding the demon dragon. You see, if the destruction of the dragon caused the gloom to disappear, then that means Ganondorf may not have been tapping into the gloom source and spreading it around, but was in fact the sole source of the gloom we see in the game. If this is true, then that basically means that all things related to gloom funnel back to Ganondorf, and as a consequence, that narrows the complexity of the world. I personally don't like this idea, but I have to admit this very well could be the case. It calls into question other darkness sources we know about in the game, such as the various shrines that have imprisoned ancient evils. It calls into question if the Blood Moon itself was a creation of Ganondorf, or something that has existed long before his feud with Raru. It even questions what the monsters are and if Ganondorf is literally creating them out of gloom. More concerning is the possibility that the monsters he summons as the Demon King could be the first instances of Bokoblins, Moblins, Lynels, and so forth in this world. Remember, if Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom are a new continuity, then it could very well be that he is the literal source of monsters we have seen so far. I don't like this idea because it pins basically everything that is bad on a singular villain. That is too simplistic. Dare I say, too childish. It could also be that the gloom that afflicted Hyrule Castle itself was coming from the source under it, from Gloom's Lair where Ganondorf was stationed. I took the opportunity to look around when diving to save Zelda and couldn't find gloom present on the surface. Even more interesting is that nearby chasms outside of the one in Hyrule Castle are all missing. Well, this one in Hyrule Field is now filled with water. All of this very much makes me wonder if the gloom and the chasms really did vanish with the destruction of the Demon Dragon. Was Ganondorf entirely to blame for them opening up? I can't be certain what is canon here. The only other point we get past this scene is in the sky, and there is no gloom there to be seen either, not that there ever was in the first place. I would like to think that gloom is a byproduct of darkness, and that darkness is a natural part of the world, something that is common in various Eastern philosophies. It could be, however, that all the gloom in the game truly does come from one person, and if that is the case, then I feel the story becomes too simplistic. It would literally boil down to Ganondorf is bad, probably for the sake of being bad, and all bad things are a result of him. I think for the sake of a more complicated world, I'm going to assume that the castle is clean, but gloom continues to exist in the depths. That darkness is a fundamental force of the world. That Ganondorf was a man born with its power, and whose hubris led him to seek power to create a world full of strife. A world where only the strong could survive. That's just my takeaway on it, and I would love to hear yours. Thanks for watching the video, I know this was a long one. Maybe consider giving the video a like and subscribing to the channel if you like content like this. If you leave a comment, I will respond to it. I need to give a big thank you to all of my Patreon and channel members. They are the ones who are making this show possible right now, and it means a great deal to me. If you would like to join the crew, click that join button or check out the description for a link to my Patreon. Right now, every little bit counts. If you do join up, you will gain access to my Discord where we can talk more directly about various topics. I play a lot of games and dabble in a lot of topics, so hit me up and I'm sure we can have a few good conversations. That's all I got for you today guys. Be safe, and may the way of the hero lead to the Triforce.